You know, in society today, there are, uh, are extremists in this world, uh, and we see that in the, the wars that are taking place and, and the, the other countries that are saying that certain countries are not where they're supposed to be. And, and, and so we see extremes. And, and even in the church, we see extremes. Because when we see the extremes in the church, there are those who said that Jesus was an itinerant preacher. He was a homeless man. And so if you're going to be like Jesus, then you need to be homeless, which means get rid of all your possessions, get rid of all your money, get rid of everything that you've got so that you can be like Jesus. And if you're like Jesus, then that's what you're going to be. Ah, and then the other end of the spectrum, you have those who are preaching prosperity theology that says, if you are a child of the king, then you should act like a child of the king and you should have all the wealth and all the riches that go along with being a king. And what I have to tell you is neither one of those are true. It's man's perception, man's adjustment of God's ways of doing things. Neither one of those are true. Money does matter. Money is a good thing. Now, in the church, sometimes we, we look at money and say it's bad. You know, if, if you're wealthy, if you're rich, if you got a whole lot, then, then you're doing something wrong, that you must be some kind of bad person. And yet, the Scripture gives to us very clear pictures of what we're supposed to be doing as far as having money. And so, let's look in the book of 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 14 and 15. This is Paul comparing himself to the way that he should be taking care of the Corinthian church as compared to the way a family is structured. And this is what he has to say. Now, for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. For children ought not to lay up for their parents, but parents for the children. A basic principle is given here that it is the parent's responsibility. And Paul's comparing this and saying, and, and this is the way I am relating to you. You're my children. And I'm not asking that you for you to lay up for me. I'm saying that I am laying up for you. Verse 15, it says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am am loved. You know, and isn't that the way parents are? You know, the more you love your kids, uh, sometimes the less they appreciate you and the more they want to pull away from you and they don't like you very much because you're working in their lives. And Paul said, I'm working for you. I would spend myself for you um, and you'll love me less for it. But that's not the point. Paul said, this is what I have to do. Comparing it to the family structure in that parents ought to be laying up for their children. Well, what's that look like? Well, that looks like working, that looks like getting money, that means passing along a heritage, a legacy, laying up for your kids is the way that it ought to be. Book of 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, this is what Paul has to say about husbands. He said, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Some translations say an infidel, an unbeliever. So then portraying again the family structure, that it is necessary for husbands to assume the rightful role in the family relationship in that they need to provide for their family. And if, if he doesn't take the responsibility to do that, he is worse than an unbeliever. So in both of these instances, it's saying that husbands ought to work and husbands ought to make money. So remember two weeks ago when we were talking, money is not bad. It, our, our society takes a mess of stuff up. They take pure things of God and they mess it up, uh, kind of like, you know, with sex. Uh, God created sex and he said it was pure and holy. When it is practiced between a husband and wife, sex is pure and holy. But our world degrades it, degenerates it, and makes it something that you don't talk about. It's a bad thing and money is the same way. It is the use of money that is the thing that's going to determine our relationship to God and our relationship to ourselves. You see, what he's saying is that you need to work. You need to make money. So making money is not a bad thing. But there are some times where it can be uh, when we start taking it as ours. In the book of Psalms, 50th Psalm, verse 10, says, For every beast of the forest is mine. This is God talking. Every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. 
You know, Psalm 20 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what he is saying is that he created everything, he sustains everything, and it all belongs to him. And yet we kind of miss that point sometimes. Because think about the things that you think are mine. You would, would, would you say, my wife? Would you say, my husband? Would you say, my kids? Would you say, my car? Would you say, my house? Would you say, my keys? Yeah, yeah well, they're, they, they really are. And you, okay, let's, let's look at it. We come out of the world, and in the world, it's all possession-driven. And in, in the possession-driven place, then what we say is that this is mine. Even in tithing, I want you to think about tithing for just a moment. Because tithing is when you give 10% to God. The word tithe is 10%. So you give 10% to God, and the other 90% is yours. Okay, oh, well, well see, there's, this is where the adjustment has to be made in the head. Because we give 10% to the Lord as the tithe, but the other 90% belongs to Him too. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So when we, we say, I give 10% to the Lord, you give 10% of what belongs to God to God to recognize Him as God. Sure enough, that's a really good thing to do. But the question is, what are you going to do with the rest of the 90% that belongs to God? It all belongs to Him. You see, a basic principle of stewardship is that He is the one who is the owner, and I am the one who is the steward. God has granted me stewardship. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, the first two verses, it says, Let not a man consider, or let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful to what? Well, faithful to God. Faithful to the mysteries of God. To be a steward means to take the things that God has given to us and begin the process of recognizing that it's not mine, it is His. He has given me ability to be a steward and to take care of what belongs to Him. See, Adam and Eve were put in the garden not to own it, but to manage it. It belonged to God. So Adam and Eve, they could have said, our garden, this is my garden, but it really was God's garden. They were just supposed to take care of it and manage it. So, you know, in this principle then of wealth, you know, Solomon was the wealthiest guy in his time. And, and when, when it, God came to him and said, Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon said, what I want is wisdom that I might rule over this great people of yours. God said to him, because you didn't ask for everything everybody else would have asked, I'll give it to you. Remember, the queen of Sheba came and brought gold and, and all sorts of things to him just because he was so recognized for his wisdom and of being the wealthiest man in the world. Now, what did Solomon do to get all of that wealth? Well, nothing. He didn't do anything because he recognized that it belonged to God and if God wanted to give it to him, he would give it to him. So here's the principle. If you have very little, uh, praise the Lord. If you have a whole lot, praise the Lord. It's not a question of what you have, it's a question of what you do with what you have. So somebody who's been given 10 bucks, what do you do with that 10 bucks? Somebody's been given a million bucks, what do you do with that million bucks? Because that demonstrates your relationship to God. Understanding that He is the owner of everything, everything belongs to Him. In the book of Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 13 through 15, He says, then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made you, uh, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. George Carlin says it like this. He said, you, you buy a house so that you can fill it up with stuff. And when it's filled up with stuff, you buy a bigger house so you can fill that up with stuff. Well, I think that you can see that this is an ongoing thing in life. You just kind of buy bigger houses so that you can buy more stuff to put in the houses. So what he is saying about this covetousness piece is that it's that unrest in us for what we don't have. The covetousness. I want, I want something more than what I have. I have a 99 Ford Taurus. Well, I'm not satisfied with the 99 Ford Taurus. I want a 2004 
Ford Taurus. Okay, I get a 2004 Ford Taurus. I'm not content with that. I want a 2009 Ford Taurus. You, you see, the principle here is this, beware of covetousness. And in America, the amount of toys that you have and the number of possessions that you have dictates your value and your worth. And God says, don't let that happen to you. Because when that begins to happen to you, then your focus isn't any longer on God. Your focus isn't any longer on doing things for God. Your focus is upon the possessions that you have and the abundance of things that are part of your life. But what we know about the abundance of things, when, we, it, when our abundance increases, so does our responsibility and our time commitment to the things that we have. So, you know, Paul said, if you can, if you can stay single, stay single because you get to work for the Lord a whole lot more. Because if you're a husband, you have a responsibility to take care of your wife. You have a responsibility to take care of your family. But if you're single, you can devote your time to the Lord. So the principle there is that it's not wrong to have a family. It's not wrong to, to put time and energy into them. It's an expectation God has. But understand that there's also this time and energy commitment that goes along with it that makes it so that you can't do other things. And so it is in our lives that when we, we understand this, uh, we're, we're going to take a look at our time. Notice what it says in the book of Proverbs, the 23rd chapter. Do not overwork to be rich. So if I need more money, then I put in overtime. And if I put in overtime, I get time and a half. And that means that every 20 hours I work, I get 30 hours worth of pay added on to my 40 hours of pay. That's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty healthy sized chunk of change. And so, you know, that's what I think I'll do. Because, and, and we can come up with all sorts of reasons and rationalizations for it. Because, you know, if I had more money, I could give more money to the church. If I had more money, I could give more money to my kids. If I had more money, I could make sure that this person's taken care of. Uh, if I had more money, uh, do not overwork. He's, and now notice he didn't say don't work to be rich. He, he says don't overwork to be rich. Why? Well, because that's where our focus is on being rich. And this is the process behind how we get there. Uh, again, let me remind you that Solomon did not do one day's work to get what he got. God chose to give it to him because his focus wasn't on the money and the things. His focus was upon God and God's people. And then God chose to make him rich. Do not overwork to be rich because of your, uh, of your own understanding. Cease. Stop it. Quit. Will you set your eyes on that which is not for riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away, an eagle towards heaven. Well, now, I think everybody is, is aware of what took place in 2008, that there were a whole bunch of people who were invested in the stock market, and during the crash, they lost over half of their investments. Well, they're predicting the same thing is going to take place next year. Uh, actually, they were predicting it this year, and now they're projecting it into next year. It's going to happen next year. There's going to be another crash. And so if you're, you're invested in the things that are going to crash, you're going to lose money. And, and what he says, that's not where your security ought to be anyway. Your security ought not to be in your wealth and in your riches. Because you should be able to be secure with 10 bucks. And you should be able to be secure with 1,000 bucks. Because it's not the bucks in which you're putting your trust, your faith. It is in God. And if God gives you $10, that's exactly what he wants you to have. He's given you exactly what he wants you to have. Now, in that then, don't overwork to be rich because all of your overwork to be rich is time taken away from God and your relationship to other people, the things that are important, things that are forever. Don't overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Stop it. You know, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm, I, I have really good rationalization abilities. I can rationalize and justify almost anything if I rely upon me and my understanding. And he says, stop it. Don't do that. The Gospel of John, the ninth chapter, verse 4. This is what Jesus said. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. I must work the works of him who sent me. Do you think that that ought to be what we would say as well? 
I must work the works of the one who sent me. Wayne, uh, is, is Wayne going to share uh, the meditation here? Uh, Matt, where are you? No, Wayne's not. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll tell you what Wayne said in the first person. <laughs> uh, Wayne shared Matthew 4, 19. And I think everybody's familiar with Matthew 4, 19. It says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And then Wayne said that uh, God's part is to make us fishers of men. Our part is to follow. Now, he also said that being a fisher of men is to go, to teach, to baptize, and to teach, given to us in Matthew 28. He said, that's what God is involving us in of making us fishers of men. And if I am not involved in that, the question isn't whether God's promise is true. The question is whether I'm following or not. I must work the works of him who sent me. See, when God called us to be one with him, then he wanted us to understand that our lives were going to be about eternity. Our lives were going to be about salvation. Our lives were going to be about getting involved in somebody else's life. And then he wants us to know that everything we are, everything we have, he has given to us for that purpose. So the question then uh, we look at Jesus' statement. He says, I must be about the works of the work of the one who sent me. I, I, I must do this. Are we doing that? Is it reflective? And the sermon title is Money Matters. Yeah, money matters. Because in our use of money, it demonstrates our relationship to God. When a person looks at their money and they understand that it is God's, and they, want, they understand that God wants them to use it, in a, in a way that is going to honor and glorify Him, it's going to bring people into a closer walk with Him, then everything that we have and everything that we are falls into that category. Now, money, again, has gotten a bad rap. And so oftentimes when you talk about money in church, people go, oh, no, this is, I just, I've heard it all. I don't need to hear this anymore. Uh, and, and, and some of you probably already have turned me off. Ding! Uh, because, you know, he's talking about this and he's going to want us to give more and, and yada, yada, yada. Nope, nope, nope. This is between you and God. I have nothing to do with it. I'm the messenger. This is something that you've got to talk to God about in your relationship to him. But notice in the book of 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, verse 17, it says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Now, notice he doesn't say, those who are rich in this age, quit it. Nope, he doesn't say that. Those who are rich in this age are bad people. Nope, he didn't say that either. He said, let the rich understand that it belongs to me. I gave it to them so that they could use it for me. And let them not depend upon it, because in depending upon it, that's pretty uncertain. 2008, it was really uncertain. 2015, it could be really uncertain. Don't trust in that. Don't depend upon that. But instead, in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. All things to enjoy. God gives us money to enjoy. God gives us possessions to enjoy. God gives us blessings to enjoy. And we don't need to feel guilty about it because God gave it to us. So Solomon didn't repent because he was the richest guy in the world. He didn't get upset, didn't feel guilty because he was the richest guy in the world. No, because he didn't do anything to get it. God just gave it to him. And what I have in my life and what you have in your life, God has given to you to enjoy. And you need to enjoy it. You need, you need to be content with it. Going back to the 99 Ford Taurus. My 99 Ford Taurus has 208,000 miles on it. Uh, and it still has no leaks. Uh, the tires still go around on it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a good car. Uh, it doesn't look very pretty, but you know that, that's, that's beside the point. It's a good car. Why? Well, it gets me where I'm going. And it gets 28 miles to the gallon in the process of doing that. That's, that's a, a good car. Uh, and, oh, and the other thing, it's paid for. I really like the, the paid for part of the car. Uh, it, 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 I don't need anything more than a 2009 Ford Taurus until it conks, and then I guess the Lord is deciding that I need something other than that. But 
it took a while for me to get to the place to where I could be content with the things that I have. Understanding it's exactly what God wants me to have. And I'm still in the process of doing that in other areas of my life. But I would ask you, God gave it to you, to en- are you enjoying it? You see, because all the time that you're thinking about something else and wishing for something else, you can't be enjoying what God has given you today. He gives us all things to enjoy. He gives us the people who are part of our life for us to enjoy. He gives to us relationships to enjoy. He gives to us things to enjoy. Think of it in this manner, uh, a young child, uh, the Christmas tree grows up and uh, there's presents under the Christmas tree and the, the child is there looking at the tree, dreaming about what is under the tree, focused on the tree, focused on the presents and, and can't wait to find out what's in it. And all that time that they're spending on looking for tomorrow, they're not enjoying today. Now that's okay for children, it's not okay for you and I. To look forward to tomorrow is to rob ourselves of today. An old saying that I I really find quite valuable, he who drags his past into his present robs himself of his future. We should be living in today, being content with the things that God has given to us and enjoying the things that God has given to us, knowing that when God wants, we're going to have something else. But until he wants, This is the way it is, and I'm going to be content in my blessedness that God has given. The next verse says, But if you are a rich person, then let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Remember two weeks ago we talked about from the book of Ephesians, fourth chapter, that the reason that you ought to stop stealing is so you can go get a job so that you can have something to give away to somebody. Well, the same thing is true here. The reason that God has given to us the things that we have, the money that we have, is so that we can be a benefit to other people in their lives. I don't need to have any more money than what I have right now. It is not a question of more. It is not a question of less. It is a question of whether I can be content with what I have right now and use what I have for the kingdom of God. So the question is yours. Money matters. What does your use and your attitude about money demonstrate in your relationship to God. Join me as we pray. Humbly we come before you to recognize that we're selfish creatures by nature. Uh, We're taught uh, very early to be selfish. And then God, by the power of your spirit, by the power of your word, you continue to work in our lives to bring us to the place to where we can change um, the way we think, uh, change our value system, Uh, change what's important to us um, by allowing ourselves to be molded and shaped into your image. So God, uh, the things that we've talked about this day, I pray that you would work in us to cause us to change and grow in our relationship to you. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.